Work and play. O oh, Kentucky, Kentucky County, a place I want to stay. Its far north gate and southern trails came Walker Boone and Kenton too. Kentucky, she is calling, a place of history. O oh, Kentucky, Kentucky County, a place to work and play. O oh, Kentucky, Kentucky County, a place I want to stay. I'm John Stevenson. June Guyman and I are glad to be back off our trip across Kentucky. We traveled some 42,000 miles gathering the history of Kentucky county by county and its tourism attractions. We hope you will appreciate the films of the history of Kentucky by your congressional districts as much as we appreciated the opportunity of traveling through Kentucky some 42,000 miles. Thank you. Now enjoy the history of Kentucky. At this time, let me introduce to you, to give you an overview of Kentucky history, Dr. Thomas Clark. Dr. Clark, we want to thank you for being with us. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. What can you tell us? We have been to every county in Kentucky. We've collected the information about the history of each county. We've come to you, Mr. History, to help us close our documentation on Kentucky by telling us a little bit how Kentucky itself got formed. Well, Kentucky had a, a bit of a nebulous beginning. This was a wide open, unexplored wilderness territory on this side of the mountains. You begin to see an opening of the door as early as uh, the, the middle decades of the 18th century. By uh, 1760, uh, Kentucky was gradually coming into focus, and by uh, 1770, it was pretty well explored uh, by the long hunters that came in, and then of course that famous party, they were long hunters too, of Daniel Boone and uh, John Finley, who came into this state. Now, contrary I think to popular belief, this was not a region unmarked by uh, no trails or no landmarks. There were buffalo traces, Indian traces across the state. As you know, uh, no major Indian tribe occupied this state. This was a borderland between the northern Indians, the, the uh, Shawnees with all their associated tribes, and the southern Chickasaw are, are group to the, the south. And there was a great deal of rivalry between them to claim this hunting ground. Now Kentucky, you know, geographically is of a highly varied nature, highly sectionalized nature. This central cane land here, or what you know as the Bluegrass Plateau, was a very famous grazing ground. There were salt licks uh, scattered around all over the state uh, where animals congregated. And the skin trade, the Indian trade, was a fairly rich one that originated here. In the early records, you have uh, stories of the long hunters pursuing both the fur trade and the skin trade, but the major emphasis was upon the skin trade itself. Then, of course, in the middle of the 18th century, the rivalry between the French and the British, and you began to having those land speculators or surveyors like Thomas Walker, Christopher Gist coming into the region, making those preliminary so-called surveys in quotation marks. From 1760 on, the British were in control of this territory. Uh, uh, the British undertook to check population expansion in this direction in the proclamation of 1763, which they were unsuccessful in doing. After 1770, you had a population movement into this region with the establishment in 1774 and 75 of Harrodsburg, or Harrodstown, and Boonesboro, Logan's Fort, and then uh, Bryan Station, Lexington Fort. We're standing right now almost on the ground where the Lexington Fort was located. From that time on, there was a great population movement into this region that you know as Kentucky, concentrated largely in this central bluegrass area. But population in time was to expand into other areas of the state. 
What were the first counties in Kentucky? Well, uh, Kentucky County was the first one in 1776. Uh, that was simply a blank. Well, I believe back of that it was Fincastle County. But Kentucky County was simply a blanket uh, spread of Virginia authority into this western country. Then in 1780 there was created the first three counties, Lafayette of Fayette, uh, Lincoln, and Jefferson counties. Uh, Fayette County covered all the area north of the Kentucky River. Uh, Lincoln County, the area east of Benson's Creek, and Jefferson County, south of the Kentucky River, and, and west and south of Benson's Creek. Benson Creek's mouth is just opposite, uh, about where that uh, uh, office plaza is in Frankfurt at the present time. Okay. During the interview, we're standing on West Main Street, which is right across from the old Fayette County Courthouse. What is the significance of this area, Dr. Clark? Well, we're standing in a very historic spot here. Right here to my right, where this Radisson Hotel is located, is the site of the old uh, Le Fort Lexington. It was built here on this uh, town creek with uh, trim cane all around it. They cleared, all, cleared the cane all around it, build a fort, and give them visibility, not to be uh, surprised by a sneak Indian attack. Right to my uh, right, on the corner of Main and Mill Street, is where the office of the True American stood. Uh, that was an anti-slavery paper published by Cassius M. Clay here in the very heart of Kentucky slavery. Uh, which uh, that office was uh, raided, uh, illegally so, uh, in violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. It was packed up. Later on, the courts uh, granted uh, Cassius M. Clay restitution, and uh, uh, he collected damages for it. To my back is Cheapside. Cheapside has a long and romantic history. Uh, here, within 50 feet of where we are standing, was the scene of the slave auctions where uh, slaves were sold out of this bluegrass region to the expanding cotton belt in the south. It's also uh, the scene of the great uh, uh, court day markets in which the livestock trade was carried on. This place used to be crowded with horses, cows, sheep, or every kind of, all of dogs, everything that people had to trade come in on court day and gather around this uh, spot. Two, it was a great uh, political uh, uh, stumping ground for politicians. I could not tell you the speakers who have uh, lifted their voice in seeking office in this square to our back. The building immediately behind us is the fifth courthouse to stand on this spot. The first one was constructed in 1788. Uh, they were either burned or torn down because they were antiquated. The fourth courthouse contained uh, the wonderful uh, piece of Kentucky artistry, Woman Triumphant, by uh, uh, the famous uh, artist, uh, just a moment, uh, I'll take it, Joel Tanner, uh, jo Tanner Hart. Uh, the courthouse burned down and destroyed that uh, uh, wonderful piece of statuary. I had an arm, forearm, of that graceful figure, which I gave to the University of Kentucky. So far as I know, that's the only existing relic of that. The, here uh, were conducted trials, lawyers, a string of Kentucky famous lawyers, uh, John Breckenridge, uh, Caleb Wallace, George Nicholas, uh, uh, on down Henry Clay, on down through uh, uh, lawyers uh, uh, of the most famous of the Kentucky bars practiced uh, in this uh, courthouse across the street. Uh, that is one of its predecessors. Here it was, right after World War II, that the um, army was called out, not the militia, the regular army was called out to quell uh, a lynch mob in the uh, famous Lovett uh, trial, in which uh, this square was seething with people with ropes and tar, threatening to lynch that Negro boy. Uh, the, the army, uh, veterans brought from the battlefield of France, uh, stood off the mob, and the trial proceeded in an orderly way. Uh, it is also a square, a statuary of John Hunt Morgan's uh, equestrian statue is over to our left. John Breckenridge's statue is here to our 
uh, on Sheepside. This was the center of the uh, business area of Lexington. Not only Lexington, but it was a kind of a nerve, commercial nerve center for all of eastern Kentucky and all of central Kentucky. Uh, Louisville, after 1820, became the major uh, commercial city of the state. Choosing a selection of the um, capital of the state, how, how was that done? It's a pretty complicated issue. Of course, uh, you would have thought they would have chosen one of the major towns in the state, uh, like Lexington or Louisville, or uh, Danville, for instance, or Harrodsburg. But they didn't. Uh, they went to Frankfurt for various reasons, and I'm not sure that I'm entirely right about all of them. But one of the reasons, it was located near the center of Kentucky population at the time. It also was located on the river, easy access by water. Uh, the people of Frankfurt supplied some materials and support for the building of a capital. And like all things everlastingly, including the, the observation of the Ten Commandments in Kentucky, there's some kind of political implication involved. Okay. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? besides the immense amounts of knowledge that you possess, how did you get in interested in history? I came to Kentucky in 1928 without knowing a single soul in this state. I got off the train down here on September the 14th, 1928, with 25,000 Kentucky Republicans milling around. I had never seen a Republican <laughs> who wasn't a postmaster until I rode in a seat from Ashland down here it, with uh, Charlie Curtis, who was running for vice president on the Hoover ticket. I came here as a student, University of Kentucky, graduate, I was a graduate of the University of Mississippi, and I started work on my master's thesis in the field of Kentucky history, writing on the subject of trade in slaves, uh, uh, livestock, and hemp between this area and the lower south and I became very much interested in the history of the state from that. And there's scarcely a day gone by in the last 60 years that some way or other I haven't been involved in uh, doing something about the history of the state. We also understand that you've written 20 plus books. Can you tell us what some of the books are, are about? Well, I've published a History of Kentucky, uh, the Exploring Kentucky, which was used a long time in the schools, I published the Kentucky in the Rivers of America series, the Rampaging Frontier, uh, Frontier America, the Emerging South, Peels, Petticoats and Plows, Southern Country Editor, and I've just published the Greening of the South, which has to do with reforestation and conservation of the Southern land. We were talking earlier about the changes that, that have been made, we've, and when we've interviewed other people, we've asked them what changes they've seen take place. Can you tell us a little bit about the changes you've observed since you've been in Kentucky? In the state or in the county? In the state. Oh, yes. The phenomenal changes. I, despite all of the discussion of the educational system, and the uh, uh, low standing in many categories of educational effort, I've seen phenomenal changes in, in educational endeavor. I think I've seen, although I'm no longer in the classroom, I think a much better prepared student is coming to college and universities now than in the old days. I've seen the family farm virtually on the way to disappearance. Who would have thought in 1928 that the great tobacco industry in this state would be threatened as it has been? Or, or you would be very remiss not to observe that Kentucky has made phenomenal progress in breaking the barrier of isolation in building its highway system and uh, going into every part of the state. Uh, in the Clements administration, that uh, legislation uh, from uh, uh, building uh, farm to market roads, uh, building the interstate highway system, and then of course supplemented by the toll road system in the state, has made marked uh, changes uh, in Kentucky. I've also seen Kentucky fail to meet its challenges, fail to come up with what it's possible for it to do. Kentucky is still 
of provincial agrarian state trying desperately to just kind of ease into the 21st century, very poorly prepared to do so. What do you think about what John's doing? I think it's very interesting indeed to go into all 120 counties in this state is a monumental undertaking. And he's gathered up a contemporary vignette uh, look at the, the state that 50 years from now, people will turn back to these uh, tapes and see that old historian in Lexington and all these people around the courthouses in 119 other counties and say, good God, is that where we were at that time? No, I think it's a, creating a very nice, interesting and useful historical document. I just wanted to come over here for a second to heap a little praise. It's not necessary, but I'm going to do it for this gentleman, Dr. Thomas Clark, because not only did he teach there at the University of Kentucky when I went there to UK, and, and I had Dr. Charles Talbert for Kentucky history, but I used your book when I taught American history in high school and Kentucky history in high school. And uh, it was a great deal of honor that I did so. You know, I look back over my history myself, and I had uh, people like, uh, Mrs. Hinsdale uh, for a history teacher in the eighth grade and you remember those people that make a mark on your life and Dr. Clark you've made a mark on many people's lives here in Kentucky and across the United States and world and we're very proud of you. Thank you sir. Thank you. you spoke of a very fine historian in Charlie Talbot. Charlie was very precise and exacting in his uh, book on uh, uh, Benjamin Logan is an excellent book. He also had a very fine volume on the history of the later years of the University of Kentucky. He, he was a, he was, and he was an excellent teacher, as the people in northern Kentucky will tell you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's indeed a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, sir. It's nice being here with you, and good luck, John. Thank you so much. And good luck. Thank you. Lady manager. <laughs> I'm John Stevenson. June Guyman and I, along with Kentucky's historians, are proud to give you the history of Kentucky in the 1st Congressional District. Wycliffe, the county seat of Ballard County. Ballard County's population is 8,250. The area square miles is 254, which ranks 83rd. Ballard County is located in the 1st Congressional District. My name is Judy McGee Stone, and I am editor of the Advance Showman and an amateur historian, though I have done several books on Ballard County, and it is a pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm Lloyd Key, Ballard County Judge Executive, and I wish to take this opportunity to welcome you to Ballard County and especially to the Ballard County Courthouse. I delight in talking about Ballard County, and I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our duck hunting and goose hunting in the area. We are the primary duck and goose hunting territory in Kentucky, and we have a lot of people that comes into our county and hunting on the Ballard County uh, game refuge, and we would like to uh, take this opportunity to tell you that there's also good fishing in this county and I have been told by some professional bass fishermen that we have some of the ba best bass fishing in the United States. A lot of people do, do not realize this and uh, we have the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, Mayfield Creek, Humphreys Creek, Swamp Lake, Clear Lake, Fish Lake, Flat Lake, Axe Lake, Mitchell Lake, and I can go on and on and on. But we do have a lot of fishing, and I would like to invite you to come to Ballard County, camping and fishing and just enjoying yourselves with your family. And at this time, I'm going to ask Judy McGee Stoner to tell you all about the Ballard County and Ballard County Courthouse. Uh, thank you. One thing, Lloyd, I think you failed to mention was the Wycliffe Mounds up here. It was formerly known as Ancient Buried City and has the relics of a tribe that preceded the Indians. And it is now owned by Murray State University and is being do, used for an awful lot of archaeological research. And Ballard County is a beautiful little county and it has fine farmland. Uh, the first 
Fort, west of Harrodsburg, was located in Wycliffe in 1780 by George Rogers Clark. And though he never lived here himself, he had a house here, and he visited when he was going to Indiana and Illinois. And it was built here to stop the Spanish and the British during the Revolutionary War. It was finally abandoned after the Indians attacked it and killed all the settlers. But after that, the county was not opened up anymore until after the Jackson Purchase. Now the Jackson Purchase comprises eight counties west of the Tennessee River. And Ballard County was formed from half of Hickman County and half of uh, Ballard County. And at that time, Ballard County is what was included the territory that is now known as Carlisle County. And Carlisle County became a separate entity in 1886. The first courthouse was built at Blandville, Kentucky in 1842. And there is a town square there where the courthouse was located. The courthouse burned in 1880. And there is a nasty rumor that the people in Wickley burnt the courthouse. And a very interesting account of this courthouse burning is found in Irvin S. Cobb's Old Judge Priest stories. And Old Judge Priest was a native of Blanville, and he, uh, he felt like that the courthouse had been burned. And I think it had been because some of the records of the first court trials came back to the courthouse in 1916 and are still a part of the records. But all the property and wills and all the legal papers were burned when the courthouse burned in 1880. Now, prior to the founding of Wycliffe, Fort Jefferson became a settlement on the Mississippi River. And as such, it was, it had a courthouse and it had a, not a courthouse, but a post office and a whiskey store and a general store and a an, and, um, timber, a lumber mill and a whiskey distillery. And it was a thriving little place. And the money from Fort Jefferson went in to be Wycliffe the county seat. Now, Wycliffe was uh, named after Colonel Charles A. Wycliffe, who was a colonel in the Civil War. And he had founded the 7th Armored Division, and he was a commandant at Columbus Belmont Park. And he was killed in the Battle of Shiloh. And uh, after he died, his heirs gave the land for the courthouse at Wycliffe. But, uh, and his brother-in-law was Sam Moore. And Sam Moore paid for the courthouse at Wycliffe out of his own pocket, the first courthouse we had. But there was an awful lot of dissatisfaction because some people in Blandville felt like that uh, Wycliffe burned the courthouse just for the heck of it, you know, to get the courthouse. So there was three major lawsuits and it was quite an argument for a number of years whether Wickley burned the courthouse or not. My opinion is that they did burn the courthouse. But anyhow, uh, it still remains. And that was the first courthouse. And the bridge turned burned between Blanville and Wycliffe. And in 1886, Carlisle County pulled out of uh, Ballard County and formed its own county with Bardwell as a county seat. And uh, during the Civil War, Ballard County uh, furnished over 800 soldiers to the Confederacy. And we have always taken our part in every kind of war or activity that the nation has had. And other than that, it is a site, present day site, of one of the largest paper mills in the country. And a lot of the economy of Wycliffe and Ballard County is based on the West Faco Mill. And except for the mill and the duck and geese hunting, well, the rest of the industry is mostly agriculture. And a few people work at the uh, atomic energy plant near Kevill. Thank you. Morgantown, the county seat of Butler County. Butler County population, 11,256 area square miles, 
431, rank 25th. Butler is located in the 1st Congressional District. My name is Michael Wallen from Morgantown. Thank you. Mary Jean Smith, Morgantown. Thank you. David Martin, County Judge Executive, Butler County. And I'm Christine Coleman, Circuit Court Clerk. All right, thank you. What could we get people to come through Morgantown to see? And, and the county itself as well. Well, I think it's just uh, it's a great place to be, great place to live. We have some of the finest people in the world here, and uh, we're just proud of it, we really are. Okay. Industry, um, what, what is your major industry in the area? Okay, of course, this is a rural county. It's strip mining, farming. We have several uh, factories here. Kelwood is one that's a clothing manufacturer. Uh, we have Kane, has been here a long time, DM Enterprises. And we're also just uh, recently uh, got a plant from Japanese, Sumitomo Electrical Wiring System. So we're real for, uh, proud of that. Christine, could you tell us a little bit about your role in the county? Well, of course, I've been circuit court clerk since 1970, and of recent years, we've been working promoting the uh, art-related, uh, we, I say, we, the uh, Morgantown Community Park Theater, uh, I served on that board for several years, and we've promoted the uh, arts in the county through the theater. We have, uh, through the George Dabb Celebration of the Arts, we've started an outdoor drama. Uh, we've presented the second year, uh, the second production this past year, and we're into the third year of that. It was very successful. It was, a, it was parented by the Historical Society. It's a work of the Historical Society, and um, our Green River Catfish Festival. This is our fifth or sixth year of that, and it's been a whopping success. We have a $10,000 catfish, and it has been caught, and uh, we hope this year the uh, festival will be even greater. There are, um, John Wells is managing the festival this year, and it's, it has some exciting new plans for um, an arts and crafts festival in the middle of that, and uh, it's not just a uh, county fair, it, it's, it's going to be uh, uh, artsy and uh, more than it's ever been before, I think. Okay, when are, what, what are the dates of the festival? It's always the uh, 4th of July weekend. Our first courthouse was built in 1810 when the county was formed and it burned and in 1872 we built a building that housed the courthouse until 1974 when we tore it down, 73 we tore it down and we moved into this building in April of 1975 and um, it, our uh, immediately preceding courthouse was a replica of the one in Brownsville. It was exactly like the one in Brownsville in Edmondson County. The history of the court and bar of Butler County is in a measure the history of Kentucky pursuant to an act of the General Assembly of Kentucky approved January the 18th, 1810, which provided for the formation of a new county out of the counties of Logan and Ohio. William Shroud, Robert Cooper, William Porter, Ben Rutherford, Hugh Morris, John Harold, Josiah Kuykendall, Thomas Carson, John Tyler, Thomas Lawrence, and George Wilson met at the house of John Tyler on Monday, June the 11th, 1810, and produced a commission from His Excellency, Excellency Charles Scott, who was then the governor of Kentucky, and he appointed them as justices of the peace of Butler County. Matthew Kuykendall was the uh, first sheriff. Robert Morrison was the county clerk. John Breathitt was, was ad admitted to the bar uh, to practice law. And he was appointed county attorney. Well, Butler County is on Green River and uh, used to be a lot of river boat traffic. But since the toll roads, that is not so now. With the toll roads coming through, the county is the biggest change in the last uh, number of years. Green River Museum at Woodbury, which is on the river. Mr. Waddle is chairman of the museum board, he can tell you. 
Uh, we had a developer museum at Woodbury at Lock and Dam Number Four, an eight-room house up there, up there where we took over from the National Park Service in Atlanta, Georgia. Now we are to continue to develop, develop that museum up there. Now we're still we won't we won't be finished with that. We're just getting in the process of renovating the museum all together. Okay. From the 15th of April. And we have a, a restaurant out there where it's a home-style restaurant. I'm sure if you through Butler County you want a good meal, stop out there and meet with us. They open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right, thank you. Princeton, the county seat of Caldwell County. Caldwell County population, 13,360. Area square miles, 347. Rank, 46. Caldwell County is located in the 1st Congressional District. I'm Jimmy Jones, Caldwell County Judge Executive. Thank you. Barbara Van Hooser, Caldwell County Clerk. I'm Jimmy Wallace, Property Evaluation Administrator of Caldwell County. All right, thank you. The judge is pressed for time, so we're just going to ask him a quick question so he can leave. Judge, what can you tell us about your position here in Caldwell County? Uh, I've been a judge executive for the last almost six years. Our unemployment in Coel County is real high, almost 15 percent. And uh, we've lost some industries and we're working, doing everything we can to bring some more back in. Well, our county was formed in 1809 and we're very proud of it. It's a good place to live, beautiful part of the state. Um, our courthouse was built in uh, by the WPA in 18, I'm sorry, 1939 and 40. I think we moved in in 19, they moved in in 1940. And um, I guess we're just like most all other towns now. We've got a lot of things we wish for that I guess are not real feasible, but uh, we'd like to see a lot of tourists come into our area. We'd like, to, mostly we'd like to see industry here. And we just like to see things keep rolling. Okay. Um, Mr. Wallace, what can you tell us about your position? Um, I've held my position as property evaluation administrator. This would be my sixth term. Uh, of course, we've seen this county grow in 1966 assessment of 66 million to well over 300 million at this time with probably uh, homestead exemptions and um, disability exemptions amounting to some $70 million. So we've increased our assessment several times. Of course, this is due to the growth in this county, which now is more or less at a standstill or even um, going backward some. We hear a lot about industry and uh, the tourists and so forth, which I think everyone agrees that we need to uh, have this as maybe our number one priority. Uh, however, Coel County and Preston is strictly an agriculture area. And as everyone knows, agriculture is in a real crisis at this time. Uh, no one seems to know the answer, and I know I certainly don't. Um, I think we need officials on the national level as well as the state level who will take a real hard look at the agriculture problems of our entire country and see what can be done to relieve some of this uh, crisis that we now have. And hopefully, uh, with a new administration in Washington, uh, and maybe here in the state of Kentucky, they can work together to relieve some of our problems. Okay. We have on the north side of the courthouse a marker that uh, shows that this was a route of the Trail of Tears, which uh, I'm not sure what year it was, but the Indians, I think, coming through. And then, uh, of course, uh, this area of the state, and particularly right here in Coel County, was noted several years ago for its night riders. We had some tobacco factories burned here during those days. Um, a lot of the officials of the night rider uh, association or group were from right here in Coel County. They were very active at their time. Uh, of course, some of the uh, older people in the county could tell you more in detail about that than Barbara and myself, but uh, it was well known during those days when uh, the people were fighting for higher tobacco prices and formed the organization which was known as the Night Riders. Okay, great. I'd like to tell you one thing, uh, you know, boost, boost the people coming into town. We have uh, the Black Patch Festival. It started out to be the Tobacco Festival. And I believe next year will be the 50th 
anniversary of when it, this thing started. And we have the street fairs. Uh, this is always in September. We have uh, street dancing. It's just our big our big day of the year here. And when is that? This is, uh, I can't give, give you the exact date, but in September each year. Okay. So it's a so real nice, it's a real nice thing. Caldwell County was the 51st county formed in 1809 from Livingston County and named in honor of General John Caldwell, a Virginian who served under General George Rogers Clark in the 1786 Indian Expedition. He later became a Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky in 1804. Princeton is the county seat located on the Cumberland River. Murray, the county seat of Callaway County. Callaway County population, 28,922. Area square miles, 386, rank 37. Callaway County is located in the 1st Congressional District. Okay, we're standing outside of the Callaway County Courthouse, which is located in Murray, Kentucky. To my left, I have Mr. and Mrs. William Furgis, who have been local merchants for how many years? 54 years. 54 years. Business being across the street from the courthouse. We were going to ask them some information on the town and the county and the county seat itself. Mr. Furgis, first of all, tell us a little bit about your business. I'm sure since you've been in town as many years as you said that you've seen some changes here. Well, quite a few changes. We started this <coughs> watch repair shop and about 54 years ago and I just got out of watchmaking school and we got married and I, I had to start in business. I couldn't get no job back then during the depression <laughs> and uh, we've uh, been in business here ever since. I went in business actually just aimed to stay a while but uh, I uh, found out I could make a living so I never did get out of business. I, what about industry? What What is the major industry in this area? Well, we have Fisher Price Toy Company that's been here for a few years and have a Briggs and Stratton uh, Motor Company which is a very good industry and, and we have Sarge Glove Company and, and uh, let's see, I don't know, we've got a little spraying company down here on another street and uh, we've got an a industrial park out there and started and there's a book company moved in out there that sells the books for the colleges and uh, it's all over this area, really. <clears throat> what about farming? Well, farming is still our major industry around here, really. It's <clears throat> a lot of big farmers. It's still doing all right. It's some of the small farmers had a hard way to go, but this <clears throat> seems like they're all getting uh, consolidated and getting bigger farmers <clears throat> now instead of a lot of little farmers. So some of the farmers, the s small farms, are merging with other farmers? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a brother who quite a, farms extensively. He does a little trucking and bulldozing, first one thing. Now, they seem like they have to do some sideline work to keep it going, but he's, he's doing all right in his farming. My name is Ann Thompson Wood. And I'm Auburn J. Wells, a former instructor at Murray State University, interested in Kentucky history. I'm glad to discuss this material with you. Uh, would you hold up the um, first one? This is a reprint of um, paper put out initially by the Ledger and Times of Murray, uh, Kentucky. It, it was uh, printed in sections uh, following World War II and uh, was able to secure the originals and had reprints made of them. And you see the title is Heroes of World War II, Callaway County, Kentucky. And it shows uh, their military records and pictures of many of them. Uh, also, uh, in the very opening pages there, is, uh, shows uh, some of those who had lost their lives in uh, World War II. The Paducah News Democrat, January 13th, 1924. And this uh, came out about the time of the end of the first semester <clears throat> of what was then called Murray State Normal School, an educational epoch in Western Kentucky. And it uh, shows the first student body, the Normal School, forerunner of Murray State University, was started in the ground floor of the Murray High School building. And this is the Murray High School building. And. Um, it shows the first president, Dr. John W. Carr. This is the um, emblem of Murray State, um, now Murray State University. 1911, for Callaway County Gazette, a special edition, and it simply deals with Callaway County and Murray, Kentucky. 
on the front is rather interesting pictures there in it shows the Indian the Western life uh, a pioneer and um, in the you may not see it here but there's a wigwam here and a cabin here and then on into the background it uh, tapers off you know into an industrial community farmland industrial community and this uh, show has pictures of uh, the early people in in Callaway County county officials and the history thereof and uh, many other interesting features including uh, advertising uh, they, in the old days this is 19 and 11 it is the printing of the Murray Ledger this was printed in uh, let me see the date is April the 15th 1916 and uh, again this is put out by um, a group from the um, Murray Methodist Church and these are the ladies involved and the gentlemen there are the publishers and whatnot the original boundaries of Callaway County, which included the present county of Marshall, were created by an act of the General Assembly approved December the 15th, 1821. The territory at that time being a part of Caldwell and Livingston counties. In 1822, the legislature passed an act establishing the county, uh, and January 16th of the following year, the commissioners appointed met in the town of Wadesboro and effected permanent organization. Callaway, the 72nd County, in order of formation, lies in the southeast quarter of the Purchase District and embraces an area of 396 square miles or 252,800 acres, bounded as follows to wit, Marshall County on the north, Tennessee River on the east, the state of Tennessee on the south, and Grace County on the west. In reference to the early settlers, uh, see this account, said according to historian Collins, James Stewart and David Jones were the first white men to locate within the present limit of Callaway County. They came here, he says, as early as 1818 from Corwell County and opened farms about one mile east of Wadesboro. The might add that Wadesboro was the first county seat of Callaway County. In the early 1840s, it was divided into two counties, Callaway and Marshall County. And the county seat was moved from Wadesboro to Murray, Kentucky. One of the things that we have learned in touring all 120 of Kentucky's counties is that it's Kentucky's people that's really made the history of this state, this great commonwealth. And frankly, uh, we have two people with us today here in Murray and Callaway County that I wanted to come across the table and interview and ask a little bit about themselves and their lives here in the Callaway County area. Let's begin first, if we may, with uh, Mrs. Wood. Mrs. Wood, uh, give us a little of your background. Where were you born and raised? And and uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, life here in, in uh, Callaway County? Well, I was born here in Callaway County, just about 500 yards from where I live now. And I have never lived anywhere else. Life in Callaway County has changed an awful lot since I was a good deal younger than I am now. Only in town were there electric lights. The rest of us used lamps and the wash pots outdoors, and we drew water from the wells or cisterns, but we didn't know we were underprivileged at all. We thought we were having just a whole lot of fun, and we did have a lot of fun. We went around to the neighbors at night and played games. I grew up in a neighborhood where there were a lot of children and we played among ourselves on Sunday afternoons and at night in the winter time and had just a very happy childhood. I went to stu I started to school at what was called then the training school, the demonstration school of the well, it was the Murray Normal School then, but it became MSU now. The training school, a demonstration school, where the students for the college could learn to teach, um, <laughs> was built and in 1924. We had a reunion Saturday night. 
of everybody who had ever gone to the training school. There were over 550, and every class from 1924 up to 1976, when the school was closed, was represented. And we had a wonderful time. As Murray State grew, it outgrew its original intent to train teachers. It became a university, and because of that, the training school had to shift names. For a while, it was college high. And then when the college became a university, it was called University School. But as the college swung away from teacher training, the school was closed in 1976. I retired from the school system, and I'm enjoying retirement here now. You're going from a little country town with gravel streets, gravel around the court square, that is to a progressive, developing, active community. And it's been a wonderful change um, in every respect. I think Murray is an up-and-coming little town or city, um, working hard at doing the best things for itself. Uh, of course, the university has been a great, a great boon to uh, the economy and the people and the culture uh, of this town. I graduated in 1924 and then I attended Murray State Normal at the beginning in the fall of 1924. I was fairly active in athletics, playing baseball, basketball, and football. In fact, I have 11 letters total that is in the four years that I spent at Murray. Uh, we had real good athletic team for a beginning school, uh, say the new kid on the block. Um, first year that I played football, or played, well, played football, we won three, lost three, tied three. And in the next year, with the advent of Coach Carlisle Cutchin from Mayfield, uh, we had uh, undefeated record, winning six and losing none. And in the next year, we only lost two. And in the final year at Murray State, uh, we had an undefeated season again, uh, having a tie game with Southern Illinois from Carbondale, but winning nine and losing none, and winning the Mississippi Valley Conference Championship in uh, football. I might add that I played on the very first basketball team in Murray's history. That'd be in 19, school year of 1925 and 26. Um, even Beginning with the basketball, we had a winning season and uh, continued that. I think Coach Carlisle Cutchins coached 17 years basketball at Murray and uh, had only one losing season. That was just by a single game. So um, I appreciated uh, the, the possibility and opportunity of playing um, in athletics for Murray State. and. I think I made also a creditable scholastic record, graduating with a distinction in 1929. I had to lay out one year to make a little money to keep, continue my education, and uh, so I graduated in 1929. I taught my first year in a one-room school, and there you were, and the county furnished coal, and that was all the county could furnish. I don't want to leave the impression that they just were mean with us. They they could furnish no more than that, and we started in the middle of the summer to use as little coal as we could. I had 14 in there, and you can do a lot of good teaching in a one-room school if it's small. One of the things I'm going to ask you here that you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but for historical purposes, uh, where were you all born and uh, approximately your age? Uh, born in Marshall County, Elva, E-L-V-A, little town, present time, was then, still is, and um, then from there moved to Callaway County, Murray. And what year was that you were born? Uh, <laughs> 1906. 1906, uh-huh. I was born out right outside Murray in western Callaway County in 1922. I'm 65. 
Fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, as I talk to both of you, I, uh, one of the greatest pleasures I enjoy in my life is, when, is the fact that I still have my father alive who's uh, in his early 80s, and I can sit and talk with him about the days that he uh, walked to the one-room mm -hmm. schoolhouse. And when we come down Highway 71 from uh, Covington to Louisville, uh, he points out on the left-hand side of the road of a house sitting over there, and he's, every time we come by there, he says, son, that's where I first went to the uh, school and uh, walked five miles one way to get to school. And sometimes I think that uh, one of the things we want uh, these tapes to do is to impart a little appreciation uh, to the younger generation and to our current citizens that make up our government structure of the importance that uh, groundwork and history is to our development as a nation and to our development as a world. Uh, because frankly, if it had not been for people like uh, uh, Mr. Wells and, and Mrs. Woods uh, and their counterparts, uh, we today would not have the freedoms that we do have in this great land called America. And as I've said as a government teacher many times, and I think you both would agree with this, the freedoms that we abuse, we tend to lose, and the freedoms that we fail to use, we tend to lose. So we all should become involved in our government and our history and helping to educate people about uh, how really good we do have it in America and how it is great to be a free nation and able to speak out on subjects such as we're doing today. John, my name is Robert O. Miller. John, I'm standing in front of the first courthouse ever erected in Callaway County. As you can see from the historical marker erected here, this was the first public building in the Jackson Purchase. It was built in 1823. And the cost of it was $100. Uh, I'm sure the audience can see it in the background. It was moved. It was moved to Murray when the original courthouse was built here, served for a while, and then later it was bought by a private citizen, and he built a home around this courthouse. And when his home then was torn down, and the original building was discovered inside there after it had been inside his house for about a hundred years, we had a crew to take it apart uh, log by log and put it back on the Murray State College campus. It did not attract much attention there. Later when the park was bought and this park was built, it was moved here and re-erected re here. Uh, it's a very historical building, and of course the oldest structure, and as I said, in the Jackson Purchase, it's a supposedly in its original condition, except of course we've chinked the logs and put a shake roof on it. This building in this park, we have the National Boy Scout Museum, which is the headquarters for the Boy Scouts of America for the United States. It's the only one in the United States moved here from Dallas, Texas. It's erected on the campus of Murray State University, and daily tours are made through the Boy Scout Museum. Uh, we also have a tablet like this, a historical marker on the campus of Murray State University where Nathan B. Stubberfield lived. Nathan B. Stubberfield is listed in the World Almanac as the inventor of radio, and although Mark Coney is listed as the perfecter of radio and the, and the security patent on the thing. Uh, Callaway County has uh, many uh, tourist attractions in addition to the Boy Scout building, the uh, Nathan B. Stubfield birthplace marker. Uh, as you know, it has 20 miles of Kentucky Lake shoreline, several nice resorts in Callaway County on Kentucky Lake. Uh, that's uh, the main tourist attraction, except the city of Hazel, which lies right on the Tennessee line, has lately became a mecca for antique dealers. There are seven or eight antique shops there. Those are the chief tourist attractions or things that visitors to our county would need to be aware of and might like to visit. John, I wouldn't want anybody to leave with the impression that this is our Callaway County Courthouse. We do have a new, fairly modern courthouse built in 1914 on the Court Square at Bury, Kentucky. In addition to that, during my last year as judge, I purchased from a federal government a United States Post Office, which is located on one corner of the Court Square, which is known as the Miller Courthouse Annex. And all the court business and the circuit court clerk, all the records for court are 
kept in that building. Uh, the original courthouse has a historical cornerstone on it built in 1914 telling who the judge and the magistrates were at the time it was built. Jerry Reed, the reference librarian at Callaway County Public Library. We've collected over 2,000 photographs now, and from that collection we have selected a, a great number. Uh, they will be published in a book called The Potpourri of Callaway County. It's a pictorial history of the county. Of two gentlemen repairing a rail fence, something typical of that period. The next photograph is a button, a wedding button. Both the bride and groom had pictures of themselves worn by their mate on their lapel on the wedding day. And this was a little keepsake that they kept throughout their, their uh, married life. Now this is a picture of Mary Russell Williams White, who was the county court clerk from 1938 to 46. She, uh, it proves that Callaway County was no, uh, uh, not averse to having women represent them in public office. Now this one shows um, Agner's Ferry when it was a um, horse-drawn apparatus. The horse walked in a pattern here and caused the wheel to turn and the wheel caused the uh, ferry to cross the river. These are some early photographs of uh, the Callaway County Court of various years. This is the first jury in the new courthouse in 1914. This shows one of the uh, one-room schoolhouses. And these are the pupils in that schoolhouse. This is a picture of Miss Sally Howard, who was a teacher at Lynn Grove, and one of the subjects that she taught was Czar, which was Russian. Max Hurt as a child. Max Hurt was a prominent man uh, here in Callaway County who did a lot of good for a lot of folks and uh, uh, he recently died and we're, he's sadly missed. These uh, show the different modes of dress as, they, as the young boys grew up. Here he's in a dress and then this was a, a day of celebration when he graduated into the short uh, pants suit. This is Nathan B. Stubblefield with his uh, completed contraption that did transmit uh, the voice. He called it his wireless telephone. The photograph shows the modest frame home of Nathan Stubblefield. It was probably the first radio broadcasting station in the world. This photograph was made soon after he returned from his trip to Washington where he demonstrated his radio on the Potomac and in Philadelphia as early as 1902. A surveyor's chain uh, that belonged to the Kurd family. He worked for the land office that was established in Wadesboro in the early 20s. That chain marked and measured all of the land in Callaway County, which at that time included Marshall County. Uh, well, it's the depot and tobacco district, and that's what the depot was used for mainly was the shipping of tobacco. Um, these are a couple of school pictures. The interior of a country store. D uh, can you use any of these? I, I just happened to cross them and they seem... Maybe. The jailhouse I, I have no details about. It's just a, uh, an early jail. It's a, a, a recent um, acquisition of the library, but we don't have details about where it was located or the date. 
This is the stock barn, which belongs to Tom and Sue Farthing. It was built um, on property which they own in New Concord in 1868. There's uh, the cornerstone uh, incorporated in that building with that date marked on it. The county public library volunteers began collecting old photographs and duplicating them five years ago. They've worked on their photograph book. It's called A Potpourri of Galloway County. They're, they are selections uh, of something less than 2,000 pictures in it, along with little bits of uh, stories, historical events, and little funny anecdotes are included in it. There will be uh, over 200 pages uh, in that book, and we're offering it for sale. The after publication price will be $35, and we'd be happy to have orders from any of you who'd like one can be mailed to the volunteers of Callaway County Public Library. Checks for $35 can be made out to Old Photo Collection and mailed to 710 Main Street, Murray, Kentucky, 42071. Bardwell the county seat of Carlisle County. Carlisle County population 5,064. Area square miles 191. Rank 108. Carlisle County is located in the first congressional district. In Carlisle County at the county seat which is located in Bardwell, Kentucky. And with me we have the Judge Executive Warren Owens and we've asked him to take a little time out of his day and provide us with some information on the county itself and the county seat. Judge. Yes. Uh, it's certainly good to have you folks with us today here and uh, appreciate you coming by. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have people visit with us. Uh, Carlisle County is, this past year, as you know, was 100 years old. In 1886, the county was uh, formed uh, from Ballard County. It was a southern, what you call South Ballard, and it was uh, made Carlisle County. John G. Carlisle uh, uh, introduced this legislation in the, in the House to get this county uh, put, uh, made a new county. And uh, it is a rather small county. Uh, we have a lot of good things here in Carlisle County. We appreciate the people and how they respond to our needs when we have a have a crisis or a real emergency. And uh, we uh, lost our old courthouse in uh, 1980, and uh, and we were very fortunate to have this nice new building here to have. Uh, to be our courthouse and court system here in Carlisle County. Just seeing the portrait of the structure, the old one was was a beautiful structure. I'm sure you were all quite sad when it went. Well, it's just like losing your home, you know, when you stayed in a place as long as uh, we. Some of us had been around the old courthouse, and we had uh, spent a lot of money repairing it and uh, doing the things that would make it a better place and, and nicer place. And uh, when you lose something like that, it's just, you know, just part, uh, just like losing part of your home or something like that because it's uh, devastating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, uh, we were very fortunate to have, uh, be able to uh, get a hold of the money to, to build this courthouse. And we still owe a lot of money on it, and, uh, but it's, it's working out fine. Well, it's a beautiful building. That, that's for sure. Judge, in, in terms of tourism, um, something we've asked most of the judges that we've met with, or someone representative of the county, is there what what are the highlights of the county as far what is what could someone do coming through your county of Carlisle, sports wise, or are there swimming activities or whatever? Well, we've got uh, a lot of lakes along the Mississippi River bottoms. In, uh, in the wintertime, when the duck season's in, we 
do have some good duck hunting at certain times in Mayfield Creek area and along the Mississippi River Flyway. And uh, of course, you know, uh, Mississippi River is something a lot of folks in the world would like to see. And uh, sometimes I think we take it for granted. We live right on the Mississippi River and uh, we just know it's a big body of water. And a lot of people around over the world, you know, they'd like to see that Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is something to see. Uh, the, uh, the duck hunting is uh, quite good in that area most of the time when the season's in, especially when the river is high and you get some water back out over the farmlands and uh, it makes it real good. Are, are there avid fishermen or is this a good place for fishing? Oh, just about everybody in Carlisle County is fishermen. Uh, they, everybody really likes to fish and they like sport fishing and uh, we got uh, several lakes in, in Carlisle County and the surrounding counties along the Mississippi River, Ohio River. So uh, we take advantage of fishing every time we get an opportunity here. They, uh, we catch some good fish here. And uh, Mississippi River furnishes a lot of fish for the commercial fishermen. And uh, we're quite interested in, in seeing that our waters stay clean and, and are not polluted so that we can use the fish out of those streams. We're hoping that we get Mayfield Creek cleaned and dredged so uh, that will be clean. We had a fourth grader the other day came to fiscal court said he'd like for us to clean up the creek down there because he fished there and it took him a long time to get his fish clean so <laughs> we'd like to get his creek cleaned up too. Great. I hope we can. Thank you Judge. As Judge Owens was saying Carlisle was the 119th county farmed in May of 1886 from Ballard County. It was named for John Griffith Carlisle, prominent Kentucky citizen. The first settlement in this area was at Fort Jefferson in 1780 by George Rogers Clark. It was still owned by the Chickasaw Indians. Fighting occurred and the settlement was abandoned in 1784 until 1823. The plot for Bardwell was surveyed in 1879 for Alonzo Shakelin and A.W. Violet, owners of the land. It was still in Ballard County and the seat was in Whitcliffe. A committee was formed to locate a county seat for Carlisle County and it met in May 1886 at Arlington, Kentucky. Both Arlington and Bardwell wanted it, but Bardwell was chosen because it was located near the center of the county. The first county court met in the Masonic Hall in Milburn with Thomas P. Hayes as the first judge. On May the 24th, 1886, Botkins Hall was designated the courthouse until a new one could be built. It was finished in 1887 and is a particularly attractive one, a two-story brick Victorian with a tall wooden cupola. Bardwell got its name from the boarded well, which was such a good one, it became a show place. Due to difficulty in pronouncing the name resulted in the town being called Bardwell. It is a center for the Illinois Central Railroad. Unfortunately, as the judge pointed out, they lost their old courthouse of 1887 from fire. Hopkinsville, the county seat of Christian County. Christian County population, 64,107. Area square miles, 722. Rank number two, Christian County, is located in the 1st Congressional District. I'm William Turner, uh, native and lifetime resident of Hopkinsville in Christian County, and as you indicated, I'm a professor of history at Hopkinsville Community College and the official historian for Hopkinsville and Christian County. We'd like some information on the structure behind us and perhaps any former courthouses before this. I commend your effort for collecting the material on courthouses in Kentucky. It's a project long overdue. Christian County is 190 years old this month. And the courthouse in front of which we're standing right now is the fourth on this site or within the immediate approximate area dating from 1799. The county was organized the 1st of March, 1797. And in November of that year, the first action was taken to construct 
the first courthouse. And presumably the next year, a log structure was built that was used for about 10 years. And we're quoting from information out of the county order books. In 1808, the first permanent courthouse was built of brick. It was a two-story structure and had a cupola. It was designed by the Louisville architect Hugh Rowland, a name very familiar in Kentucky architectural history. In 1836, that building had become dilapidated and the county had not kept it up. And so according to the county court records, then the third courthouse was built, the second brick on this same site, built in 1836-1838. And we have a photograph of that courthouse, for it was the one burned on the 12th of December in 1864 by Confederate General Highland B. Lyon, better known as the courthouse burner throughout western Kentucky. And so, through the years immediately following the war between the states, or as I jokingly say, the War of Northern Aggression, then the court met in various buildings around town. In 1867, construction was started on this present courthouse. It was designed by the Louisville architect Joseph K. Frick, whose name appears in the keystone over the arch here at the front door. Frick would later settle in Evansville and is remembered for a number of uh, buildings he designed up there. And the building we now use as our county courthouse cost $100,000, and a portion of that money was obtained from the federal government by act of Congress, as did a number of other counties receive money from the federal government for repayment of loss due to rebel uh, insurrection and rebel destruction of courthouses. I believe of the approximate $100,000 cost involved, federal funding amounted to about 15000 And so I would venture a guess as far as Hopkinsville and Christian County go that this receipt of $15,000 was probably the first federal grant of money. We were talking about the present courthouse completed and occupied in July of 1869, and since that time to the present, it has served as the official uh, seat of justice for the county of Christian. There have been a number of events, a part of the life of this community, as I'm sure you find all across the Commonwealth of Kentucky, relative to human interest stories out of old courthouses. The most celebrated event, I guess, ever to take place within the walls of this old structure was the famous Knight Rider trial. The Knight Rider were farmers upset over the low price they were receiving for their dark tobacco in the first decade of this century and so a group of farmers throughout the Black Patch, some 35 counties in western Kentucky and western Tennessee, organized what they knew as the Silent Brigade and they went about attempting to attract attention of other farmers to join the association and thus create a holding action against Buck Duke's American Tobacco Trust and thereby raise the price of their dark tobacco. Well Dr. David Amos of the little community of Cobb in Caldwell County to the northwest of us was singled out as the leader, the alleged leader of the Silent Brigade. And in March of 1911, I remember it vividly, the eyes and ears of all of Kentucky were tuned to Hopkinsville to the famous Knight Rider trial. It occurred upstairs in the circuit court room of this building for a week in 1911. Uh, the jury, by the way, of 12 consisted of 11 farmers and one town carpenter just recently moved to town from the country. So we have a very strong impression about the consistency of the jury on that occasion. And so Dr. Amos was adjudged not guilty and fortunate that he was because my prediction would have been that we would have had near rioting in the streets of Hopkinsville had he been found guilty. Later on, uh, Governor Augustus E. Wilson promised that he would personally pardon anyone who killed a Knight Rider and that took the wind out of their sails and within a very short period of time the Knight Rider movement was history. Also on the steps of this courthouse in the 1920s we had a sheriff who shot and killed his son-in-law in the courthouse. Self-defense, of course, was the claim, and that was the extent of it. One story is related about a circuit judge we had here early in the century, Judge Jack Henberry. One day he was conducting court, and uh, apparently it was a, a widely publicized case, and the windows of the circuit courtroom on the second floor above were raised, and quite a crowd had gathered here in front and around on the side of the building to try to listen to the testimony. And remember, this was in the day before microphones. Well, apparently, amid all of the deliberation in court, the group inside distinctly heard the braying of a very typical Kentucky animal, 
four legs in consistency. We know it in Western Kentucky as a jackass. And as the jackass breed, a ripple of laughter swept across the courtroom and the judge wrapped the gavel on the podium and called out, one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time. And that, of course, broke up the crowd. <laughs> So there are a few thoughts that come to mind about uh, the life of events in this community within the courthouse. We'll turn our attention to the photographs you're holding so you won't think you have become a statue and are going to be here permanently. Before us is a photograph of the Hugh Rowland designed 1836-38 courthouse on this present site. It was burned by Confederate General Highland Lyon on December 12, 1864. And then moving along, and I'll move these out of the way, just to our left, where the Alhambra Theater is now located, to your left, stood the clerk's office building. And this was for the county records. Hence, our county records are intact back to March 1st, 1797. Because of the time of the fire in 1864, the records were maintained within the clerk's office building next door. The group out front are the Latham Light Guards, the local company of state militia, Company D, as they were known. And then moving along through these photographs, the next one is the earliest located photograph of the present Christian County Courthouse, circa 1870. The building at that time was about one year old. And then we'll turn the other one in this way. Uh, friend. The uh, picture before you there is a lithograph or a line drawing of the Christian County Courthouse as it appeared in the Perrin History of Christian County, 1884. William Henry Perrin of Louisville compiled a number of county histories in the 1880s, and Christian was fortunate enough to be included within that group, and consequently uh, this drawing of the courthouse in that building. The next photograph is a copy from a postcard view of the courthouse around 1895. And you will observe in this picture that the cupola atop the building is somewhat different from the later one. So there have been two different cupolas on top of this structure. The one pictured here was removed in 1903 to be replaced by the one we'll see photographed uh, coming up in just a moment. The next photograph is a picture of the grocery delivery wagon of W.T. Cooper and Company. W.T. Cooper was located across the street in this building you see to your right with his name still uh, embossed in metal there on the front of the building and uh, he had the diamond grocery store and fortunately for our interest in the courthouse he had the uh, grocery wagon and horse lined up right in front of the building when the picture was made. And then a photograph from a 1930 vintage of the circuit court clerk, Judge Ira D. Smith. Excuse me, the circuit judge. The man on the right is circuit judge Ira D. Smith, who, if information is correct from Frankfurt, uh, the indication is given that he is the longest serving circuit judge in Kentucky history. He was on the bench here for 40 years and he is still living in a local nursing home at the age of 98. The man to his right is the circuit court clerk, Phelan Clark. So again, circuit court clerk, Phelan Clark, circuit judge, Ira D. Smith, photographed in the circuit courtroom about 1930. Among the treasures of our local photographs, this one is one that is of great interest to me, as all of them are for that fact, but this one especially because it's an interior view of the circuit court clerk's office in 1897 and is the earliest located photograph of the interior of the courthouse. And you might note the coal-fired stove with the scuttle and the pipe going to the flue above, the wicker bottom chair, the matting on the floor, and uh, the men, the personalities sitting around, certainly portray an interesting characteristic. You find it all across Kentucky in all courthouses. The gas lights were an innovation of that particular era. The courthouse was one of the first buildings in town to have a furnace installed in it. One of the first buildings in town to be wired for electricity in the 1890s.
An unusual photograph of the courthouse in the fact that the picture from April 1910, and I said April, indicates a fresh fallen snow. Very unusual for April, and someone had the presence of mind to go make a picture of the trees that stood here in front of the courthouse on that uh, momentous event in local weather history. This is a photograph of the interior of the county clerk's office in 1924 with the beloved and well-known local political figure, Dr. Frank H. Bassett, on the extreme left facing the picture. George Powell, the former county court clerk on the right. The man next to him is the late Vigo Barnes, who for a number of years was the commissioner of economic security for the state of Kentucky. And the three women were clerks in the county clerk's office in that 1924 view. In the early 1950s, a terrible storm crisscrossed Christian County and blew the metal roof of the courthouse off. And through the effort of the county employees, the records were not damaged by the ensuing water that came through the roof of the building. And someone happened to photograph this rather unusual event in the, the history of the Christian County Courthouse. Another photograph that portrays a great interesting angle in Kentucky history is the counting of ballots after an election. And I guess all across the Commonwealth, uh, election balloting was done within the circuit courtroom. And you'll notice the lineup of ballot boxes across the front and the tellers at the table as they were calculating the vote. You know, today we know the results in 30 minutes. In the years of the ballot boxes, we were sometimes two or three days knowing the results. And the passage of time heightened the interest and attention and anxiety and consequently this was a very important event. No doubt the politicians are gathered around as are officials to make sure that the voting is done properly. And this was the circuit, same circuit courtroom by the way in which the celebrated Knight Rider trial was held in March of 1911. And last, last but not least, a photograph of the courthouse in 1960 when the 1903 cupola was being removed. It was removed because county officials feared the heavy weight of the superstructure was a too great a stress on the upper uh, support beams in the roof of the courthouse, so it was taken off. We've always found of humor the sign, one way do not enter, that appeared right in front of the courthouse from the angle shot of this photographic view, 1960. I would like to introduce to your film archive the assistant county attorney James G. Adams Jr., better known as Jim. Jim happened to stumble out of the courthouse there a few minutes ago, and I'm mighty glad you came along to be recorded, sir. Glad to be with you, William. Thank you, Jim. Um, a couple of things, John, I might mention, first of all, because of your association with the Department of Motor Vehicle Registration, we would call to your attention the fact that in our local Pennaroyal Area Museum, we have a complete collection of Kentucky automobile license plates dating back to 1910 and including the first four years of porcelain plates. We've had dated, year dated plates in Kentucky since 1914 according to our research. And the collection there representing a number of years of effort is one of uh, interest to a number of people who come through the museum. And you ask secondly for us to relate for just a moment some of the landmarks relative to the history of this community, there are many. First of all, the Pennaroyal Area Museum, of which Jim Adams is board chairman currently, and uh, the historian here is a board member, attempts to collect and share the history of not only Hopkinsville and Christian County, but the Pennaroyal area, as we refer to the Pennaroyal region, the Pennaroyal. Hopkinsville and Christian County is the birthplace of Jefferson Davis, only president of the Confederate States of America. And the monument at Fairview, 10 miles east, is built near the site of his birth, a real tourist attraction to the people here in the, this immediate part of western Kentucky. Fort Campbell, 16 miles to the south, is a large military base established in 1941 and completed in 1942 as Camp Campbell. 
a place where prior to the Normandy invasion of D-Day saw a troop strength of some 90,000 soldiers. An event, by the way, I might add, that brought ecstasy to the young ladies of Hopkinsville and Clarksville and made the young men of these communities mad as the hinges of Hades for all of the competition. Also, I would call your attention to Pilot Rock and Natural Bridge, two natural formations located northeast of Hopkinsville on or near the Todd County land. The Confederate Monument at Riverside Cemetery commemorates the burial place of 101 unknown Confederate soldiers, now known, by the way. The Pioneer Cemetery, the resting place for the early settlers of this community, was opened in 1812. I'm also reminded, among other personalities from here, that Adley Ewing Stevenson, Vice President of the United States under Grover Cleveland between 1893 and 1897, was born at Herndon, some 10 miles south of Hopkinsville. The Stevenson family had settled here in, from North Carolina early in the century and would move on to Illinois, to Bloomington, Illinois, in 1853. Christian County is also the birthplace of Edward T. Ned Breathitt, governor of Kentucky between 1963 and 1967, and the first of what we believe will be a number of governors from Hopkinsville and Christian County. Jim, do you think of other personalities from here we might mention? I believe you covered it, William. Marion, the county seat of Crittenden County. Crittenden County population, 8,989. Area square miles, 360. Rank, 42nd. Crittenden County is located in the 1st Congressional District. We're standing in front of the Crittenden County seat, which is located in Marion, Kentucky. And with me, we have two gentlemen, which are local historians. I'm going to ask both of them to introduce themselves and to give some background on the area. Your name? Your name? Thomas Tucker. Thomas lives two doors down, by the way. <laughs> I'm B.C. McNeely, and I'll give some of the history of the county. Our first permanent settlers arrived in the county around 1790 to 1810. The county was originally a part of Livingston County and was formed into a separate county in 1842. The county was named for J John J. Crittenden, one of the early statesmen of the, of the state of Kentucky. He was a U.S. Senator five terms and also was governor of the state of Kentucky. Many of the early settlers of the county uh, were veterans of the Revolutionary War and the War of 18 and 12, and uh, they were awarded land for their services in these wars, and they settled here in, the, in this county. Uh, uh, one of the routes, east-west routes, of the early settlers when they were traveling west came through Crittenden County and crossed the Ohio River at the, a site known as Ford's Ferry. Uh, they say that in the early days that the traffic was so heavy that uh, during the daytime hours you would never be outside of another wagon. There was always one either in front or in the rear. And uh, much of the history of the county is centered around the site of Ford's Ferry and the alleged history which has come down through the years of the Ford's Ferry gang which they, uh, many people say uh, killed and robbed many of the travelers who uh, traveled through this area. Uh, the first courthouse was occupied by federal troops during the Civil War and uh, the, the courthouse was burned to the ground by Confederate troops in 1865 and these troops were commanded by General H.B. Lyons of the Confederate Army. Uh, Ollie M. James, um, excuse me, Ollie M. James, a Democrat, and William J. Debo, a Republican, uh, were U.S. Senators from this county. Also, Lee Cruz, a native of this county, was the second governor of the state of Oklahoma. Tom Wallace, the well-known editor of the Courier Journal and Louisville Times for many years, was a native of Crittenden County. Crittenden is a rural county with farming its main industry. 
For many years, fluor spar mining was the was a flourishing industry in the county until the business was lost to the uh, Mexico miners because of the uh, e e not for economic reasons. River right opposite this county on the Ohio side at Cave and Rock is the cave where all the uh, bandits and everything hid out back in the uh, early 1800s, late 1870, the outlaws of Cave and Rock. That was uh, Jim Ford from Ford's Ferry, the one. He had something, to, supposed to have had something to do with it. And um, it's a very beautiful place over there. There's high bluffs all along the river. That's where they're fussing about the state line. Okay. We come right within about 20 feet of the caves. We weren't trying to claim the cave, understand, but it's a beautiful place over there. But uh, really... Well, there's a city of Marion here, the Foles Hall, which is one of the, is a historical building which is, is on the register of, um, what do you call it, the register of the uh, historical sites historical in the state, yeah. in the state. and uh, it's been uh, reclaimed now by the Chamber of Commerce. It's a building that was built by Julius Foles, who was a uh, leader in the fluor spar industry and also then was into the was an oil man, and he built the building and gave it to the city back in, and to the county back in uh, about 1928, I believe, or 29. And it was used for a school for uh, up until about 10 years ago, and. Uh, when they gave it up, the, they let the city, the county have it, and the uh, Chamber of Commerce now is operating it, uh, or rather the city is, through a, uh, an organization which has been founded. And uh, it's a very beautiful building, and, and it's well worth going to see. And then we also have the Crittenden County Museum, which is just a block from the courthouse, which is uh, one of the better museums in, the, in this end of the state. It is really packed with the... Uh, relics and uh, parts of our history there in the county. It's not open. It won't be open now until March, but uh, uh, until the middle of March, but it's open all during the summer months. Okay. The current courthouse was erected in the 1950s, and we can see that Crittenden County has a long history of courthouses. The first courthouse was built in 1842 and thought to be logged. The second one was a small brick one and was burned in January 1865 by General Lyon's forces on his last raid into the state. Plundering was done by both sides. Records were destroyed. A new courthouse was built after the war, but in May 1870 this was destroyed by an accidental fire. A handsome new courthouse was constructed upon the same spot and was completed in October 1871. Of course, the present for courthouse was built just a short few years ago. And I have been reading old Crittenden presses, which are on microfilm, over at the library. And I have some prize articles that I have read in there. I'll read you one or two. Uh, there's an advertisement in the 1906 Crittenden Press. It says, you dig your grave with your teeth. Keep them in good shape, Dr. Frederick S. Stilwell over Marion Bank. There was a distillery in Marion in 1906, and the advertisement for it was the Old Hickory Distillery. Old Hickory is as pure as the dew and as good for medicinal purposes as ever. Take home a bottle. Twill keep off malaria and drive away the blues. <laughs> We just left having a good breakfast over at a place called the Coffee Shop in Marion, the county seat of Crittenden County. One of the things to promote tourism in the state of Kentucky that we can recommend to you is the fine quality food that can be found at some of the small restaurants located in each of the county seats around Kentucky. And here in Marion, in Crittenden County, we found the coffee shop which is owned and operated by an interesting lady. Mr. McNeely, tell us a little bit about Erica. Erica is from Germany. She's a native of Germany. She married an American uh, soldier and they and they moved to Marion and she's been the proprietor of the coffee shop for some 10 years now and she's a very wonderful lady and, and very interesting and uh, very friendly and she would be delighted to have anyone stop in and see her. One of the things that you learn about uh, small communities like this is that 
Places like the coffee shop often become sort of a meeting place, both in the mornings before people go to work and in the evenings after they get off of work. In visiting here last night and spending the night here in Crittenden County, I was really uh, impressed by the camaraderie and the sort of familiness of the community, and I think you all are proud of that, and I think it's exemplified by this lovely structure here behind us, where the community has uh, uh, taken abreast of uh, the opportunity to promote tourism and, and create this uh, fine tourism attraction here for Crittenden County. Tell us a little about this building and how it came to be. Uh, Foles Hall was built by Julius Foles, uh, who was a native of Crittenden County and uh, who made a fortune in the oil fields in Oklahoma. And uh, he built the building and paid the, all the complete cost, which was around $73,000 in 19 and 26. It was donated to the community and to the, to the Marion, city of Marion and was used as a high school building and, and, a, and a community center for many years. Uh, some, it was, the building was abandoned some five years ago and was given to the, given to the county. And uh, the, 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 an organization was formed the Foles Hall Incorporated, which is made up of citizens in the county with the board of directors, and they may, they restored the building through foundation grants and through donations, and also through uh, grants from the Foles family. And uh, it has been restored and is a community building now, a community center, is occupied by the uh, Chamber of Commerce here in the city, uh, and is used as a community building. Uh, the building was, a, was a selected as a Kentucky landmark in June of 1981 and was accepted on the National Register of Historic Places in May of 1982. Uh, Tom, anything that you'd like to add to that about the structure here? We, B.C. and I went to school here. And we graduated <laughs> from Foles Hall. And I understand that this structure across the street here is some history also. We also went to school there. It was a, built as a private home, and it was sold later to the Marion High School, Marion uh, Educate, Board of Education, and they used it in addition to Foles Hall for the high school students, and we went there also. They, and were, the, they were the high school, the Marion High School, until it consolidated with the county in the 1950s. And both of you gentlemen are lifelong residents of uh, Crittenden County, is that correct? Yes, we are. We were born here. Uh, tell us, Tom, what uh, uh, did you do for a living here in the uh, county? I was a funeral director. My father was before me since I started in 1904 until I sold it five years ago and retired. That was the Tucker family uh, funeral home? Yes, it was. Uh -huh. And, uh, B.C., what did you do here? I'm a native of the county. Uh, I've been a farmer and a rural mail care for some 30 years and have been a lifelong resident of the, and I still live in the county. And I ass assume that uh, we can impart to our listening audience that uh, uh, life has been good to you folks here in Crittenden County and you're proud of being a part of this area. It's a wonderful place to live. Building Fo uh, Foles Hall was built by a local contractor, the Boston Lumber Company, in 1926. Uh, it's native limestone was used for the foundation of the building. It is a two-store building with four columns of ionic design flanking the main entrance. On the first floor, the building has a large central hall with large rooms on each side and the auditorium and or gymnasium at the hall's end. The second floor contains two additional rooms, the balcony and a projection room for the auditorium. The basement contains two large rooms which were once used as laboratories for science, agriculture, and home economics, along with restrooms and dressing room facilities. The building's foundation is ruble masonry made from Crittenden County limestone. Workers from Tennessee prepared the foundation for the J.N. Boston and Son Company, which constructed the building. That Joe Julius Foles' picture there, the one that gave the building and had it built presented to the community. He lived in Marion, Kentucky from the time he was 10 years old until, until he was through school, I guess. Through college. Through uh -huh. college, yeah. The room where they had the band practice during school, and uh, it is now the, uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce for the 
city of Marion, for the county, Crittenden County. Gave okay, the county with the bill in 1926, and this is the original county, and it's in perfect condition. It's restored with the class of Marion High School of 1940. They spent several thousand dollars to get it restored. And this facility here is used now for what purposes? As a community building, and they have different uh, affairs here. They have, there's a square dancing group uses it regularly, and uh, plays, they band have plays concerts, and, and uh, singing groups, and just a lot of different activities. That any, it's, it's available for rent to anybody in the community that wants to hold an activity here. Years when it was used for school was the library and uh, the study hall was in the large area. It was filled with tables and chairs and students, this is where they spent their study hall there. Hickman, the county seat of Fulton County. Fulton County population, 8,099. Area square miles, 211. Rank, 96th. Fulton County is located in the 1st Congressional District. We're standing outside of the Fulton County Courthouse, which is located in Hickman, Kentucky. With me we have two gentlemen who are going to give us a little background information on the county seat and the county itself of Fulton. I'm going to ask both gentlemen to introduce themselves. I'm Nelson D. Hill, Sheriff of Fulton County. I'm D. Langford, County Clerk, Fulton County. Okay, thank you. What can what can you tell us about the county itself? The county goes back to 1845. Before that, it was Mills Corn. In 1845, the county was formed, and it came off of Hickman County. And it was named after the steamboater Robert Fulton. And also, the city of Hickman was a guy named Marr, and his uh, wife's maiden name was Hickman and uh, he named it Hickman after her. Okay, thank you. Um, what can you tell us in terms of the history of the courthouse itself, the structure, which happens to be a beautiful structure? The county's courthouse in Fulton County, Kentucky was built in 1903 and there were six county seats across this great state, or United States, that was built at the same time. And there's only two county seats standing now, which Fulton County is one, and West Virginia has the other. And uh, it cost from $15,000 to $18,000 to build the county seat in Fulton County. That's some good information. We were asking everybody that, were, that represents each county that we're talking with, what would you suggest people come and see? What, what are the tourist sites here in your county? Because we're also trying to promote tourism for each county. We have the Mississippi River, which is only a stone's throw from the county seat. We have Rio Foot Lake, which was formed in 1811 and 12, which is only six miles from the county seat. And we have all kinds of uh, farming industry, wildlife management, hunting, sport fishing, and you name it, and we've got some of it. I went in the office the first time in the 1970, and uh, this makes my third term, and uh, the sheriff is chief law enforcement officer of his county, in which I assist uh, the other city police is here in this county, and uh, then I work the whole county with one chief deputy. Okay, thank you. Dee, can you tell us about your position here at the courthouse? After coming home out of World War II, uh, I decided that I'd want to serve the people of Fulton County. And in 1962, I was elected county clerk in Fulton County, Kentucky, and I am de deeply indebted to every person, every taxpayer in Fulton County as, as having elected me year after year as to be their county clerk. My name is William L. Shadowin. I'm uh, the circuit judge of the First Judicial District, or circuit. This first uh, circuit includes this county we're in now, it's Fulton County, it's the far end of the state. From here to Ashland, you're about 700 miles away. We go up the river Mississippi to Hickman County next, then uh, uh, Carlisle County and Ballard County. From Ballard County to Fulton County, from county seat to county seat, it's about 45 miles by nearest roads. 
those four counties are the ones that I cover and uh, it's a circuit area and we have two district judges uh, the district judge will do all misdemeanor cases and uh, there's one for Hickman and Fulton County and there's one in for uh, Carlisle and Ballard counties their term is for four years my term is an eight-year term sometimes it almost seems like a lifetime the district courts handle uh, misdemeanor cases. A misdemeanor by that I mean is that it carries a fine or a jail sentence of no longer than 12 months in a county jail. My jurisdiction would be on felony cases and that's ones that go for people if convicted or sent to the state penitentiary. Uh, civil matters, we, I commence at $2,500. The district court would have any jurisdiction on the smaller claims of less than $2,500. They also have a small claims court where no attorneys are involved and they go up, I think, to $1,500. And they also handle juveniles. I do not do that unless they've been certified to me for a serious crime such as murder. I believe that's it. Now, all of these four counties originated out of Hickman County. And then uh, I think Fulton County was cut off of Hickman, then uh, uh, Ballard County. Then Carlisle was uh, cut off of off of Ball uh, Carlisle was cut off of Ballard County. Yes, uh, the Mayfield Creek. Usually the terrain had something to do with how the counties were divided and set up. Thank part, you. Part of Callaway came off of Hickman County. Yes, Callaway. Part, part of Callaway and Graves County came yeah. off of Hickman County. Judge, what can you tell us about? Um, we, we've already obtained some information on the courthouse itself, but what can you tell us about the clock? All right. Uh, in each of the counties, all of them had uh, uh, a clock and a bell system. And this was what the people uh, carried out their time. They knew their meetings were done. Now, in the one in Fulton County, it still works, and it, it, it's, and it keeps an accurate time. Now, when we're in the court, uh, having court, you'll hear it. And sometimes we have to uh, just take a slight recess there for a few minutes till the chimes quit. But uh, uh, if you'll notice, wherever they're located, they usually dominate the community in which they're in. In Carlisle County, it was just recently burned of a year or two, so they have a new courthouse, and there's no chimes or, or clock now on that one. But you'll find one in uh, Hickman County that does not work, and the one in Ballard County does work. And Ballard, Hickman, and Fulton counties, all of them will be loaded with wasps and birds and things of that nature. So when you go up there, you'll, uh, you'll get a grand view. <laughs> Particularly here, now you're overlooking the Mississippi River and you're on a big bluff and uh, you can see for miles up there and you don't have to get too high. The same is true in Ballard County. Now Carlisle County is a considerable distance from the river as, as is Hickman County. But uh, the two ends of, of uh, my circuit in Ballard and Carlisle are great views of the river and the whole surrounding area. This, this property drops off two to three hundred feet and uh, you'll see the river down here below and now, and now it is, it's, uh, it's probably 41 feet. It's not quite flood stage but it is exceeding its boundaries you see a tremendous amount of water. The project you have that you're doing now I think is an excellent one, uh, particularly we're having a lot of complaints about uh, children in schools not having enough history or knowing enough about their, particularly in their state history. And I think this is an excellent idea to get this across and I know that every judge that I know, particularly circuit and district and the, the county officials are more than willing to uh, give any information or advice they have on the history of their office and the courthouse and the county to the students. And since television is such a, a large uh, uh, media now and acknowledged and all students watch it for pleasure or otherwise, this is a great way to get across to them what really they need to know. Okay, thank you. Would you mind introducing yourself? James Cooper. I'm the caretaker of the Fulton County Courthouse Clock. And um, it's uh, Self Thomas Works and it uh, was put up there in 1904. And the courthouse was built in 1903. So it took them a year to get the clock up there. How long have you How long have you taken care of that clock? Oh, about ever since about the fifties. You know, completely overhauled it about 12 years ago. Okay, thank you. Would you mind introducing yourself? I am Danny Zickafoos, the pastor of the First Baptist Church here in Hickman. Uh, we're the oldest church in town. It was established in 1846. Uh, in the same location it now sets. It burnt in 1879, was blown away by a tornado in 1901, and burnt again in the early 1960s at the time they built the present building. And we're just real, real happy. I've been living in Hickman about two years. It's a beautiful town.
Mayfield, the county seat of Graves County. Graves County population, 32,934. Area square miles, 557. Rank, 7th. Graves County is located in the 1st Congressional District. With me today, we have a gentleman, R.B. Ligon, who is a well-noted local historian, and we wanted to ask him a few questions about the area, the courthouse, and the county itself. Mr. Ligon, I'm just going to ask you to tell us everything you know about the area and the county. Well, to begin with, um, Graves County was carved out of what was known uh, in historical circles as the Jackson Purchase. And the reason for the Jackson Purchase was when Kentucky was first admitted into the Union as a state back in 1792, uh, the title to this part of the state, this part of the state west of the Tennessee River, uh, wasn't exactly clear. And uh, so uh, when uh, when, when uh, the governor Isaac, the former governor of Kentucky, Isaac Shelby, who was Kentucky's first governor, uh, he and Andrew Jackson were commissioned by by the, the current governor at that time uh, to uh, negotiate a treaty with the Chickasaw Indian Nation. Now, the Jackson Purchase really involved three different states, Kentucky and Tennessee and northern Mississippi, uh, and extended from uh, the Ohio River on the north to the Yazoo River on the south and from the Tennessee River on the east to the Mississippi River uh, on the west. And so uh, Kentucky's part of the Jackson Purchase uh, consisted of, of these nine counties that are, that are west of the Tennessee River, the counties of Ballard, Carlisle, Hickman, Fulton, Graves, Callaway, and Mark completed, which was on the 18th day of October, the 19th day of October, 1818. This, to begin with, this was all uh, a part of Hickman County. And then one by one, various counties began to be carved out of Hickman County. And Graves County was carved out of Hickman County in 1823 and was created by an act of the legislature. It was passed in the closing days of, of 1823, and so that really marks the beginning of Graves County. And uh, the city of Mayfield had been founded and established by a few settlers uh, like the Anderson family uh, and the Shelton family and a few other pioneer families. And, um, and the site of Mayfield was, was selected uh, where we're standing now. And the first courthouse that was built uh, was, a, was a log structure uh, it was built in 1824, and a replica of it stood in the northwest corner of our courthouse yard until a few years ago. And then the second courthouse, a brick structure, and uh, the commissioners that were responsible for the building of the courthouse were William Burklow and, and, and John Cunningham. And this structure, which was built in 1834, stood until 1864, when the Confederate troops that occupied the courthouse during the Civil War, when they were forced then to abandon and evacuate the courthouse, then they burned it. So uh, the next year then, in 1865, uh, the third courthouse was built, and it stood until 1880, it was either in 1887 or 1888, when the courthouse burned, the third courthouse, and the present courthouse was built and completed and ready for occupancy in the year 1889. The building that, that we see here now uh, goes back to 1889. And then in 1935, as a part of the Public Works Administration project, an addition was added to the courthouse on, on the south side, which gives our present courthouse the shape of a T. And so uh, the, the courthouse here um, is probably, well, it's not exactly the oldest structure in Mayfield. There are some houses in Mayfield that uh, are, are older um, than, than the courthouse. Um, Graves County was, um, was created by act of legislature in 1824. And um, let's see, an area of 18 miles wide and 30 miles long was designated 
to, to be the, the length and the width of the county. So Graves County has an approximate area of about 540 or 550 square miles. And it's the only county in the state of Kentucky that has four square corners. It's shaped like a perfect rectangle, and each, each corner has a, has a perfect right angle to it. Um, some of the um, first officials of Graves County, um, let's see, Elijah Cravens was the first sheriff of Graves County, and uh, we had some, um, and Graves County has sent uh, various individuals to Congress. In the 38th Congress, Lucian Anderson served as, uh, as our congressman from 1863 to 1868, and he is the only Republican to ever serve in the House of Representatives from Graves County. Uh, Judge Andrew R. Boone from 1875 to 1879 also served as our representative. And in the, from the 63rd to the 69th Congress, Albin W. Barkley, who was a native of Graves County and having been born in, in the area of what we call Wheel in the northwest uh, corner of the county, uh, Albin Barkley served as our representative uh, until about uh, 1926. Now, Barclay went to the United States Senate in 1926 when he defeated Senator Richard Ernst, who was a Republican. And so from 1927 to 1956, uh, Senator Barclay was, was in the United States Senate with the exception of the time that he served as Vice President under, under Harry Truman. Um, among some of our earlier representatives, in a um, later representatives rather, uh, to Congress from Graves County, were W. Voris Gregory, who served from 1927 to 1936, and in the 75th to the 86th Congress, his brother Noble Gregory served as our representative, and then in, eight, in 1974 for the 84th Congress, or no, it's the 94th Congress by uh, our present representative, Carol Hubbard, uh, served as, um, has served as our representative from uh, 1974 to, to the present uh, time. And uh, Graves County was originally carved up into eight magisterial districts. Each district was seven and a half miles one way by, by nine miles the other. And uh, districts, uh, districts one, three, five, and seven were in the western half of the county, and districts two, four, six, and eight were in the eastern ha ha half of the county. And Graves County had the magisterial form of government until about uh, 20 years ago, when the present commission form of government was, um, was, was organized. So instead of having eight magistrates on the physical court like we used to have, we just have three commissioners now. Uh, that, that serve uh, on our, our fiscal court. Graves County, incidentally, is the oldest, is the only county in the state that has four square corners, and it is, is shaped like a perfect rectangle, just just like th this sheet of paper. And it's in 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 its land area, it's the fourth largest county in, in the state as far as its land area goes. Uh, Pike County, I believe, is the largest county in the state, followed by Pulaski, and then Christian County, which is up here in western Kentucky, up here at Hopkinsville. And so Graves County is the fourth ranking county in the state um, population-wise. And uh, Graves County has had uh, uh, quite a history uh, behind it. It was named after Captain Benjamin Franklin Graves, who died in the War of 1812 in the Battle of the River Racine in Michigan. Captain Pasquale Hickman was also killed at the same time in the same battle, and he is the man for whom Hickman County was named. Graves County is the largest county in the purchase area and is the fourth largest county in the area in the state. It is the only county with four square corners being a perfect rectangle. It is 18 miles by 30 miles for an area of about 540 square miles. It is only exceeded in area by Pike, Pulaski, and Christian counties. Mayfield Creek is the largest and most important water course flowing in a northwestern course for from, its court, from its source in Callaway County. It was named for George Mayfield, a great Indian scout, and, and um, 
He also served as an interpreter for General Andrew Jackson during the negotiation with the Chickasaw Indian Nations, uh, which made possible the, the negotiation of the Jackson Purchase from, from the Chickasaw Nation. Little O'Brien Creek rises in the county and flows into Hickman County. Clark's River's West Fork flows across the eastern part of the county and empties into the Ohio River. Brush Creek and Little Mayfield Creek and Barn Creek are also, uh, and Blakemore Creek and Terrapin Creek and Knob Creek are also in the south part uh, uh, of the county. And uh, Mayfield was chosen to be the county seat because we are so close to the geographical center uh, uh, of the county. In fact, in fact, Mayfield, where we're now standing, is almost in the, in the exact geographical center uh, of, of the county. And, um, of course, as I said a while ago, the first courthouse was built in 1824, which was a log structure. And the second courthouse, which was the first brick structure, was built in 1834 and served then until 1864 when the Confederate soldiers burned it as they evacuated it. And then the present courthouse, uh, well, that courthouse burned then in 1887. And the present courthouse was completed and ready for occupancy by 1889. And um, that's the courthouse that we see standing, standing today there. And so uh, some of the earliest uh, uh, cities in Graves County, Old Feliciano was one of the earliest towns that was founded. And uh, it, it existed until about 1854 when the railroad first came to Graves County. Well, it bypassed Feliciana and went over to Water Valley in, instead. And so after that, why well, then Feliciana as a, as a city uh, ju just simply di died out. And uh, let's see, uh, Wingo and Water Valley were started as stations along the, the old Memphis, New Orleans, and Northern Railroad. That was the name that the, that the first railroad uh, had, Memphis, New or Orleans, and Northern Railroad. And then it became known as the Newport News and Mississippi Valley Railroad. And then along about the turn of the century, it became known as the Illinois Central Railroad, or, or the IC Railroad. Uh, and it remained in the IC, as, an IC, as the IC Railroad until uh, David Reed and John Smith, who are in the crushed stone and coal business, bought the railroad individually. And so they, those two men own the railroad individually now. And uh, we used to have passenger trains running through Mayfield here. Uh, the last passenger train that ran, ran in Mayfield, uh, I believe, was in 1957. And so we don't have any passenger train service in Mayfield a a anymore. Um, Graves County, uh, had a school system that that was started um, all some time after the Civil War, and um, uh, up until about 1907 or 1908, why well, the city school system and the county school system was was all in one. But then, um, when Mayfield began growing as a as a city. And, and more and a good big size big sizable portion of its population was in Mayfield then they decided then that they better organize two school systems and so the county organized a school system it's of its own separate and apart from um, our, our city school system uh, the city of Wingo uh, had the first high school that was ever built in Graves County and our high school here uh, goes back to about 1910 when the old West Kentucky College folded in 1909, and so the city of Mayfield then bought the property and established our public school system.